next reading is from Mark chapter 12, 10, sorry, verses 2 to 16. And in the Church Bible, it is page 1014. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you that this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. When they are in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. The little children and Jesus. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. I'm reading Psalm 26, and it's on page 556. Psalm 26 of David. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For your love is ever before me, and I walk continue in your truth. I do not sit what deceitful men with deceitful men, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I adore the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash I wash my hands in innocence and go after your altar, O Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. I love the house where you live, O Lord, the place where your glory dwells. Do not take away my soul along with sinners, my death with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are wicked schemes whose right hands are full of bribes, and I lead, and I lead a blameless life. Redeem me, and my merciful fall to you. My feet stand on level ground in the greatest assembly, and I will praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, this morning we have Reverend Jeremy as well, he's going to teach us. Um, He started teaching from yesterday because um, (laughs) he called me to say, oh, he's the one coming to teach today. And I'm like, I'm leading um, communion for the first time. I don't know what to do. And he actually spoke to me and, you know, kind of put my mind at rest. So 
Let's welcome him as um, he speaks to us about the passage today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's a great privilege for me to come and share with you this morning. And um, I don't know if any of you can tell, but that's quite a tricky passage to come and share about, particularly to uh, relatively, I know some of you and some of you have seen me before I came before and uh, I spoke. And um, I've had a lovely time. And I've had a lovely time this morning. And I want to thank Ify very much for really leading us into the presence of the Lord with the, with the music and all the band as well and very, very precious that is. So thank you very much. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have come to us by sending Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you came and you lived and you spoke and you are the message to the world. And having been killed but then risen from the dead and then ascended into heaven, you sent the Holy Spirit upon the church so that we might know the glory of God and have the revelation of the Lord Jesus in us and the truth of his invitation that we are in him. So Lord, come this morning and open our eyes to your message, the message that you are giving to us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This uh, passage is quite tough, and I don't know if um, you've ever had uh, a time where you've opened the Bible and you've actually felt condemned by the words that you read. Does anybody identify with that ever? That you've actually felt condemned by what it says. Well, I have too. And in fact, I spent about two years at one point in my life uh, really rather desperate because I felt that God had judged me because I had, could, a situation had not happened as I'd hoped. And it was a broken relationship which I thought was going to go in one direction and it went in another direction. So I feel I have, I, I spent two years feeling that I was actually discarded as a result of that in my life and disqualified from serving God in my life. I don't know, but that's a pretty heavy thing to carry for two years. Uh, and the question that came uh, towards the end of that was, was this question. Is there mercy with God? Is there mercy with God? And I remember the very place I could probably go to the, if it's still there, the post in the park where I sat down and, and I finally just put my hands up and said, God, is there mercy with you? And popping into my head came Psalm 103. Who heals, who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. So God, I discovered, was able to bring mercy to situations that have gone wrong. Um, I, wouldn't, I would really love it if actually we could just quickly turn to Romans chapter 8 in your Bibles. It's on page, I'll tell you where it is in a minute. 1134. 1134, thank you very much. And I'd love us all, if, we've got, if you've got sight of it, uh, to read this bit together, actually, because I want everything that I say following this to be in the context of this glorious word from God. So let's read together. Are you, have you all got that? Yep. Romans 8, verse 1. Life through the Spirit. So we're going to say this together. Therefore... 
there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. And we'll stop there. There is therefore, the, re the version I have in my head is, there is therefore now no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation. And it's therefore because Christ paid the price. There is no condemnation to the body of Christ, to those who have repented and believed and trusted in Jesus and come into a place where actually our life comes not from our performance, but from his performance. That we have taken on and clothed ourselves with. In other words, we live not in the light of our works, but in the light of his finished work at Calvary and the victory of resurrection. Okay? That's really important for me to say. And, and that whole concept of being in Christ is absolutely central to us understanding this passage. Okay. The first so the first point I want to make is that there's therefore now no condemnation. This, then we go on and we see, we see Jesus in his ministry, don't we? Actually explaining that, particularly in the woman caught in adultery. Woman, where are your accusers? And she looks up through her tears because she's absolutely terrified for her life. She knows what's about to come and that is a bunch of stones that are going to keep on coming until she has died. So she's terrified of this condemnation, this judgment, and she's, then Jesus comes in and steps in. And he brings a wisdom that overcomes the sin. Amazing, it's wonderful. There are none, and they left, if you remember, they left from the oldest down to the youngest. It's an amazing, where are they? And where are your... You know, who condemn, who's condemning you? Nor do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Okay, so there's a little, little truth in that little passage there which we really need to get hold of in our own lives as well, which I'll, bring, I'll come back to. We had the uh, prisoner on the cross who said, remember me in, in when, you receive, you know, when you go to your father, remember me. This day you will be with me in paradise. So, what I, what I believe, what's difficult about this passage is that we've actually got to understand the categories that we're really talking about. What you've got is Pharisees coming to Jesus and testing him and challenging him with this whole issue of divorce. And it's, uh, it's a tricky one. And uh, it feels like Jesus is about to get trapped. Because Jesus is teaching mercy and forgiveness, but he's also teaching something else. And what we need to understand is that there is here a clash of cultures. Jesus is bringing one culture, and the Pharisees are bringing another culture. And what we've got is the interaction at the point of impact between these two cultures. The religious institution, the Pharisees, coming and challenging the man from heaven who is teaching what? What is Jesus teaching? What is his, the main thrust of his message? Sorry? Love, yep. Yep, 
But if you were to bring it all into one thing, what would that one thing that Jesus was coming to teach? Salvation? That's Thank you very much. It's the kingdom of God, isn't it? Repent and believe. The kingdom of heaven is very close to you today. Come, has come very near. So yeah, actually Jesus is coming and bringing the culture of heaven and it's being confronted with a very worldly culture of control and institution. The Pharisees. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He says that uh, in, in Matthew 23, he says, you lay heavy burdens on your disciples, on the, on the people, and you do not lift a finger to help them to go in to the kingdom or into the heavenly place or into the temple, into the place of worship. You lay heavy burdens on them. He says, you are whited sepulchers. You are <laughs> hypocrites. Serpents, snakes, brood of vipers, pretty heavy, heavy language for speaking about these people who've come now to challenge him. He had no time for that institution and for that worldly way of thinking. So, at this point, it's really important for us to understand Jesus' mission and what it is. So before we go to the passage, I want us just to, to get our heads. Uh, we've got a, a dear friend who sometimes talks about hoovering your head, if I can use, a, uh, use that term. Vacuuming your head might be more appropriate, but she, she talks about that. Getting your head clear and clean from a lot of the junk that gets piled on the inside. Are you with me there? And, and actually, to read this clean, we need to really understand what Jesus was about and what he was doing and what he was saying. He came to declare the kingdom of heaven on earth. And he said, repent. Repent and believe. Now, in the old covenant, which has been referred to in the, 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 the verses that you brought, and in the Old Testament... In the Old Covenant, what you've got is the law of Moses. And we, have, we, read, we referred to that law in Romans 8. The law was given as a guide and a structure to bring the people into an understanding of the holiness of God. Is that fair? The law was there to, so that we would understand the holiness of God. And of course, in that covenant, and the covenant of Abraham before the children of Israel were called to be a people and a p the people, the chosen people of God who would worship him in such a way that they were a light to the rest of the world and bear fruits of blessing the whole of the world through their worship. And we know that the Ethi Ethiopian eunuch came in to Jerusalem to discover about worship. There's a little picture of exactly what that was supposed to be but when Jesus came, he found no fruit, that the fruit he was looking for. And there are other parables which speak about coming to the vineyard and there are waste, wasters, wasters leading it and, and not looking after it. So God sends messengers and finally he sends his son. So in the new covenant, what we have, through the cross, he's established a new people. Sorry, is that all right? What have I done? I just came out very loud. Through the cross, he's established a new covenant for us to enter into a relationship with the Father, which is free and that we've actually come in. And so we are grafted in to become the people who bring blessing to the world. Okay, that's fair enough, isn't it? God has chosen the church, it says in Ephesians, that through the church, God would reveal the manifest wisdom of God to the principalities and powers that run the world. So if we are the called people, as the church, the called people to reveal God to the world, and through Jesus we've received the hope, from Jesus we've received the Holy Spirit to live and be transformed and set free and come into relationship with 
the Father and, and the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we actually come in Christ into that relationship, then there's a task for us. And that is that we shine as lights to reveal God to the world. Then we get what happens when it goes wrong, which is where this divorce bit comes in. So, uh, what I've set up so far is that we actually have a job to do. And what we find in the New Testament all the way through is particularly in the book of Ephesians, we see, P uh, we see Paul who ha sets up the blessings of what we are in Christ. And then he says, and therefore, this is how you should live. Because if you don't look and live like this, then you are going to fail to accomplish what you're here to do. And what we're here to do is reveal the Trinity and the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in our community. So our community reflects his community. So then, actually, the mission of God goes on and the world is touched and the world is blessed. We had a wonderful um, word this morning as we prayed about chains being broken. And it was all about that freedom from those things which bind and restrict us from doing. And the church gets bound up and restricted from doing what it's meant to be doing. Okay. So this divorce teaching is set against the marriage teaching. Okay, so in the, in the passage it says that... Um, Marriage is a creation ordinance. It says, um, oh, I've got the wrong page there. Oh, here it is, sorry. It says that, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So in creation, God has set up this metaphor of marriage, of the bringing together of male and female, so that they have a kind of relationship which, uh, which is a kind of story. It's a picture for us which illustrates and shows us or has the potential for showing us what actually the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is like. So the heavenly is revealed in the earthly metaphor. And so we as church are the metaphor for the relationship, of the, the heavenly relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the question then comes, divorce right or wrong okay so it's very easy for us to say now if the purpose of marriage was that it is acting as a metaphor explaining something about intimacy about trust about cooperation and collaboration and all those wonderful things and family these uh, these aspects of um, what a family can, can bring. So a family brings unity, you hope. You know, there's lots of wonderful aspects of, of here. So I've got here, marriage is a perfect metaphor of the Trinity. It brings home, there's a sense of home, family, nurture, safety, security, love, unity. And then worship and headship and leadership and all of those principles, you can understand that. So when, when we ask the question, divorce, right or wrong, what Jesus is really saying is that if divorce happens because of, as he says, because of hardness of heart, then there's mercy in there in the sense that this is not, this, is, this isn't working, but actually it is an offense to the creation ordinance of marriage in in the beginning and God's purposes. But we could say exactly the same, but whereas there is dishonor in a church, it is offending the metaphor of church to do the task that it is here to do. When there is gossip or lack of love or whatever else it might be, where, where there's division, it, it, is, it is causing there to be a breach in the purposes of the metaphor that God planned it for. Is that, is that clear now? 
So divorce, right or wrong, well, Jesus has to say it's wrong because of that purpose that it has and the potential that it has in creation. Now, I know that in real true life of my son when he was a very small boy, in mommy, in real true life, he used to say, in real true life, these things do happen. And in any group of people, there will be many who have been touched by divorce and with for whom divorce is an absolute uh, tragedy and, 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 a, and a sore that is very difficult to heal. So I am not coming here with a message of condemnation. I hope you got that from the beginning. All right? Uh, this is actually a message of revelation, to bring the revelation of God's purposes into order so that we can then go forward with a true sense of the potential of what it is. It, and the ref, it reflects on how we are as church and how we are in our relationships and so on. Am I perfect? No, I'm not. Have I got it right? No, I haven't. But actually, it's always good to be reminded and brought back, isn't it, to the original purpose. So we are called to be what God wants us to be as church, as individuals, as a community, and in our families and in marriage and so on. I don't need to persuade anybody that divorce is a bad thing. All right. It may be better than the damage that could happen in a situation that has broken down. Right? Do you understand that? All right. But it doesn't make it a good thing. Are you with me? It's still a bad thing. And, it's, and uh, the picture that somebody once had was that you glue two pieces of paper together. They become one piece of paper. You try and tear it there is going to be damage. So it's not a good thing. But my message in terms of all of that is that Jesus was speaking to the institution. He was speaking to those who were kind of trying to, they were trying to uh, challenge him and pull him up and stop him from, um, th they were trying to find fault with him. Okay, religious people were coming to find fault with him and his message. Uh, and, but we have to go back to what his original purpose was. And that is that he has come to, to create a new community. But you see that it says on there, Ephesians 2.22, you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Perfect. So anything that stops or mars the potential of that is an offense against the original purpose. All right, so nobody's going to say that divorce is a good thing. But if it happens, what are we going to say? Well, actually, what we're going to say is that through the resurrection of Jesus and the, and the, and the finished work of the cross, that we are about to take part in remembering, in communion, that he brings new things. You can summarize that by saying that God plays jazz, all right? God plays jazz. And what that means is that when a jazz musician plays, a jazz musician learns to turn a slip into a passing note. Okay, so you, you play a wrong note. You play a wrong note, and actually what you turn it into is a note that leads you into something new. Have you got that? So you, you, you maybe play a wrong note, but it actually turns into something creative that creates a new way forward and actually creates wonderful music. So God's creation is going on all the time. So we, in, 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 are, we saying, are we saying that um, mistakes don't happen or no, we're not? Are we saying that if mistakes happen, that's the end? Like I spent two years wandering. Okay. Then, no, we find that there's mercy with God, and then we find the creative, uh, wonderful creative newness of what God wants to do uh, coming through. So then we come to 
the next part of the passage which says about little children. It says, people were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and put, uh, put his hands on them and blessed them. Okay, so what we've got is um, a wonderful picture of Jesus sitting in the middle and little children coming to him and being blessed. So what you see there is right after this difficult question where the Pharisees don't get it, in Psalm 26, we see this thing between Israel and the unrighteous and David. So David is there, and you've got this, con this contact between uh, one culture and another culture. Then you have the Pharisees coming to Jesus, another conflict of two cultures. Then now you've got the, f the, the disciples who really haven't got it either. They haven't understood it. They haven't understood that the kingdom of heaven is what it's all about. And it's bringing in this new order. And so uh, I want to ask you, how do you get into a family? How do you become a member of a family? How do you become a member of your family? Okay? By being born. All right? And by being a child. And that's the picture that Jesus is bringing here that the way that we enter the family of God is by being a child. Okay, so there's all the, the aspects of what a child is like that we can think of. A child is not coming in to tell you what it's like or to dictate to you how it's going to be. We went to a lovely family last night and the children were just so biddable, it was amazing to see these children going to bed like little, <laughs> they were quite compliant. But um, so what I'm saying is that there's something about children, and we have a little baby here, a beautiful little baby, and new children coming in. There's something about that innocence that we have to have to enter into the kingdom. And we mustn't lose it. We mustn't get so big in our own sight that we miss the fact that we've come into this family of God. So actually what we've got is this wonderful sense that whenever we come as a little child, I'm coming to an end now, whatever, whenever we come as a little child to the Father, there's always new. There's always something new. Those condemning words which say, you know, if you which are very strong, actually, aren't they? If you leave your husband and go and marry someone else, you are committing adultery. Now, the point about that is that Jesus cannot water down the principle of holiness. He cannot water down the high level of um, his purposes for the sake of our weakness. Now, you've got to understand that. So that the principle always releases the blessing of the principle, always. When we get it wrong, we come in humbly, we repent, and we trust, and we walk with God, and we say, Lord, draw a line. Do you remember he drew a line in the sand with the woman? He drew in the sand, and he said, neither do I condemn you. There's a line in the sand that Jesus is drawing for you today as we come to communion. So where things have gone wrong, even if we are in situations which, where the Bible seems to condemn us, we come into a new place and we are released by the grace and the mercy of God because he is always creating, as it were, making us new creatures. We're a new creation in him. So Israel missed the point. Israel didn't get it. The Pharisees didn't get it. The disciples didn't get it. What's the next question? Do I get it? 
Do I get it? That the kingdom of heaven for us is this wonderful opportunity of new things. And as we just release ourselves and receive the blessings of the blood of Christ in our lives to come and cleanse us and start new, today is the beginning of a new season. So where it's crashed, where it's burnt, where it's broken, do you remember it says, had their demons known the wisdom of God, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Because it was through the crashing, burning, and destruction of Jesus' ministry and life that we see the glorious wisdom of resurrection coming out of it. A new start, new creature, new life, spring coming up. And I believe, I, when, I, when we were praying before, there was this, I had this strong sense. We had chains being broken, smashed with a hammer. Okay? So if your heart's been chained up by some sense that God is condemning you, today is the day for the chains to be broken. And I had a sense that God is going, you know those kind of modern showers with a, with a, with a, a shower rose that kind of fills the shower almost. And then you get a power shower going... <laughs> That is the cleansing that God wants for us today. Is that good news? It's good news. So let's pray. I'm going to pray and we're going to get on with communion. I know I've gone on slightly longer than I hoped to, but I hope that we've really understood this amazing good news of grace, even through a passage. So Jesus didn't compromise the standard of holiness because he always wants us to enter into the blessings of it. And he gives us a new start. So let's just pray. There may be people here who are hurting. There may be people who've really been damaged by other people and uh, are really looking for a new start. So let's just come. Holy Spirit, will you come now? By your power, enter the hearts of those who close doors. Father God, I pray that you would just, by the warmth of your love, open the clenched fists of those who've really struggled to let go and let you in again. They've been coming and coming and coming to church, but there's this secret pain. And so, Lord, we pray that your healing will come today. In Jesus' name, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Move in your mighty power to bring new seasons, to draw the line that there would be heard deep down in the hearts of everyone here. Those words of Jesus, neither do I condemn you go and sin no more. So Lord Jesus, we thank you that in your teaching, you never let go of the high message, the high calling of your, uh, that, that you came to teach us the kingdom. So Lord, I pray for Christ Church, I pray for everyone here, that the, the new life of the Spirit will reveal the great creativity of God in bringing new seasons to everyone here a new season through the turning around repenting of the old and believing the wonderful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ Amen